So it's a, a great honour to, to be here today and speak to all the families of a Marin County and, and across the, the West Coast. Uh, it, it's always great to be here and spend time with you. And uh, I hope that you will be able to get something out of this. Ah, there we are. So um, this is a series that we're doing, and we've done two so far. The first one being about having a recovery mindset and moving into a bit of optimism that someday recovery for your loved one might be possible. And that recovery might mean living a decent quality of life despite having some symptoms. We move from there into the commonest symptom in severe mental disorder, which is loss of insight and loss of the sense of self. And hopefully we were able to come up with some ideas last time as to things that you might do at home to help if your loved one lacks insight. So we're moving on now to the issue of trying to help a loved one make sense of the baffling experience that they're going through. So I hope there's something here for you today that you can use in the home environment. Uh, but we're certainly very grateful to the sponsor for allowing these sessions to happen. So, Making sense of psychosis, that is our topic for today. My first question is, should we bother making sense of psychosis? Why not just leave it as it is? So that's, that's the first thing to decide, to decide if we want to move into any of these other potential approaches. Now, certainly the commonest thing, when we started doing this was back in the 1980s, we moved slightly away from the medical model and we started using normalizing explanations. So people that were hearing voices and had delusions, we were saying these things are very common in society and they usually get better. So the feedback from the the service users, when we started doing that, was that this really helped. But the label of the schizophrenia spectrum carries so much stigma that we had to do something about that as well. And if we could get beyond a, these kind of explanations, it was looking at the individual response to a baffling psychotic symptom. And the ABC model is something you might be able to use at home to help your loved one deal better with voices, delusions, or negative symptoms. Um, after that, we go on to some slightly more complex, but, but I think it is possible for everyone with a psychosis to do this, which is to look at what does the person do when they have symptoms? How do they react emotionally and behaviorally? And could we change it? So that's about what keeps psychosis going. Can we make sense of this as a life development that has actually emerged from previous life experiences. And this is the idea of the timeline. So there's a whole load of things that we could be doing at home or we could be helping our mental health team by backing them up in the home environment with the interventions that they're trying to deliver. And then the last one, can we actually get to the far end of it like we've done in the previous two talks and actually decide, hey, this psychosis has helped me in some way. It makes me make better sense 
of my life. So that this is coming to that end point where you feel enriched by the psychosis. And many, many people can get to that. So why bother making sense of it? <clears throat> Well, certainly the case that if you get a diagnosis of schizophrenia, really anywhere in the world, there are no cultures that have a positive take on this word. It usually leads to pessimism, anger, and anxiety. What will this label mean for me for the future? So, if we can make sense of it in, in some way that makes that label less disturbing, then surely that would be a good thing. I mean, certainly the case that social isolation is the commonest response to voice hearing and delusions. People just stop interacting with others. And We'll see later that social isolation is a powerful maintaining factor for the psychotic symptoms. If you don't have logical explanations, then maybe they are replaced by magical and very frightening ones. So almost everybody who has a severe mental illness comes up with their own explanation or relies on a cultural explanation, which might be a very frightening one. Anxiety is everywhere in psychosis. So anything we can do to reduce anxiety can allow the beginnings of that recovery trajectory. The emotion of stigma and the schizophrenia spectrum, certainly the most stigmatized diagnosis, but I think all psychiatric diagnoses are stigmatized. Depression used to be very heavily stigmatized, perhaps less so now, but still stigmatizing. And shame leads you to stop talking to other people and retreat further into your own world. As such, without being able to make sense of it, Many people give up their hobbies, their activities, their relationships, and they retreat into a world of isolation where psychosis is perpetuated by their isolation and their emotional response. So I'm really arguing that it's key that we try to help loved ones to make sense of their experience. We know that people who develop severe mental illness usually have a lower self-confidence before the disorder starts, and it certainly gets lower once the stigma kicks in. But we also know that they tend to be people who have reduced self-nurture. So very often, they're not taking care of themselves. They're not giving themselves positive messages, not doing things to look after the mind and the body, even before the psychosis starts. So if we can get to a point of making some sense of it, maybe all these negative maintaining factors can start to be switched off. And if we can start to switch them off, maybe that recovery will start to emerge. So this is what I'm hoping we're going to possibly learn about today. So I think it is a very good idea to make sense of it. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy came from the Stoic philosophers going way, way back. And this is Marcus Aurelius, one of the first of them. And of course, he appeared in the film Gladiator. I don't know if you remember it, but that was Marcus Aurelius. And he wrote some amazing things. He said that all of us have power only really over our own thoughts. 
we can't actually change what's outside of us. So cognitive behavioral therapy emerged from this in terms of the idea that we can actually change the way we think and make it more attuned to reality. He also said this, the soul becomes dyed with the color of its thoughts. Now that's a very poetic and a very interesting statement. So if you think nothing but angry thoughts, you become an angry soul and you just tend to repeat that angry interaction with life. But Marcus Aurelius said, it doesn't have to be that way. We can change the way we think about things. We can change these repetitive ways of being. And in psychosis, we get very stuck in certain ways of thinking. Our life is what our thoughts make it. So that this is really putting the onus on us to view the world in a different way and think differently and then start to hit targets. So cognitive behavioral therapy is about starting to hit targets. Everything we think is a perspective, not the truth. Well, that's true. None of us actually know the truth, do we? We have perspectives on the truth and those perspectives can be more or less accurate. Now, the last one that he says here, I, I don't quite understand. Fear of death is the root of madness. Now, he himself had a death phobia and philosophically he cured it. I'm not going to tell you how he did that today, but it is a very interesting philosophical approach to deal with a severe phobia. So that's what the old Stoics said. And after the Stoics, there was many hundreds of years of trying to explain things. And then Freud came along and uh, Freud and the analysts had a very different view. They, they said that there are unconscious drives and these boil over when the ego can't contain them and they then appear as symptoms in the external world. So Freud had a kind of volcano metaphor for what psychosis was. Again, this is quite interesting, but in the, the therapy that I've done, I've, I've had some evidence of things like this, but I, I think it is, it, it's too raw. It's too much of a kind of a, a, a repression and failure of repression type of explanation. So the Freudian explanations kind of don't maybe help our loved ones too much. Very often people with psychosis don't have any explanation. And this, of course, is the famous Munk painting from Oslo in Norway to show just the existential terror of the strangeness of what's happening to you and the deterioration in your life and in your abilities. So we sure need some kind of explanation. Now, this is a young Doug Turkington in Glasgow, long ago, 1986, when I trained in psychiatry. And this was what I was taught to say to people who had, had a schizophrenia diagnosis. And in some ways, at the time, I thought it was quite good. And I, I think psychiatrists... Even now, this we're like nearly 40 years down the line, I think are saying something very similar to this, but maybe the, the family members will be able to tell me if this is still the message that a psychiatrists are giving out. You have schizophrenia. It is a severe long-term mental illness, and mostly the cause is genetic. It's a problem with brain wiring. It just hasn't wired correctly. 
in your adolescence when the brain is developing. And then because your brain hasn't developed right, you've got you've had an experience of stress and the brain has fired off these symptoms of voices, paranoia, problems in speaking coherently and your negative symptoms. That's what's happened to you. Now, there is some treatment. There is some intramuscular injections we can give once every couple of weeks or once a month. You'll probably be on these for life. We can teach you a bit more about these symptoms. We can give you some social skills training in a group. And there's some slow stream rehabilitation. To be honest, these symptoms will probably always be there to some degree. And you might need hospital from time to time. But we will give you a psychiatric nurse and outpatient appointments to support you and your family. So obviously, I'm very interested to know if the family members listening have received similar sorts of explanations or if the explanations that you and your loved ones get are now different in some way. I think there are some good things about that, but I think the overall feel of it is pessimistic. It is stigmatizing. I think there's a lot of it that's just plain not true. And I think there's no mention of recovery anywhere here. So potentially it could this explanation could lock you in even further into a kind of perpetuated psychosis. So I've moved a long way from this now, though I'm keen to hear if it's still what people are being told. So is there a biological model which is better? Well, this is a model which was developed by Paul Gilbert, and he says this is what the normal mind is like. So this is what we're all meant to be like. So there is a threat system in the brain. Everyone needs one of these. And he argues it's a serotonin-based system. Back in the day, we need to keep an eye open for dinosaurs, other predators, all kinds of dangerous stuff out there. And we had to be aware of that. So we've got a threat system there. There's a drive system. Back in the day, we had to go out and build a shelter. We had to, to make a spear or whatever to defend us ourselves. And th these were tasks that had to be done. The drive system was a dopamine-based system and was in balance with the threat system. Now, the other big circle there is the one that I mentioned, which was often switched off, and that is the self-soothing system. And this is an endorphin-based system. So we have a system within our body which is there to self-nurture us, to help us get involved in play, creativity, to connect with other people, um, to be in touch with our environment. So if these biological systems are in balance, according to Paul Gilbert, things are going good and we can hit our targets, we can be balanced biologically and emotionally, and life can kind of work pretty good. However, take the example of trauma. We know that if a child is traumatized or an adolescent is bullied, this self-soothing system can switch off. And that means that other systems can take over the biology of the brain. So in the case of the hallucinating and paranoid mind, the self-soothing system is switched off. The serotonin system is very active and the dopamine system is very active. And we get stuck in that biological way of being. Now, Paul Gilbert says that if the threat system and the drive system are switching off, you're going to get depressed. 
And if this, the threat system is overactive, you're going to get anxious. And if both these systems are overactive, you're going to get psychosis. So this is quite an interesting model because it shows the person with psychosis that we all have these systems and it's a question of balancing them up. And there's things we can do to get the mind back into balance. For example, there's medicines, dopamine blockers, which will calm down the drive system. And there's drugs like clozapine, which will calm down both drive and threat systems. And then there's therapy approaches, which can activate the endorphin-based system. So this model, it might be a bit too complex, but there are many people that can get it and feel more encouraged about it. So between these two different explanations, my old psychiatric view and this newer a brain systems approach, the two explanations are different. One of them is about genetics and isn't really interested about what the person's been through. It talks about a wiring failure. So there's something organically wrong with the brain. It predicts chronicity and the need for long-term care, lifelong medication and long-term support. And I must be honest, the people I used to give that explanation to were never very happy about it. It is one depressing explanation. This newer explanation is much more normalizing. It shows we've all got these brain systems and it's a lot about the life events we go through. Genetics are only a small bit of it. Medication is needed for a period to balance these systems, but someday it might be possible to reduce it and maybe even discontinue it. The endorphin system can be switched on again and you can start being creative and being able to play and enjoy your life. The second explanation expects recovery, but I've had it said to me, you are being too hopeful now and that doesn't help people either. Maybe somewhere between the two is the best explanation. But the, when I gave my explanation out in Glasgow all these years ago, this is another monk painting. It's a painting of depression. And, and you see the person sitting in their own, lost in their thoughts, have been given this very negative, pessimistic explanation of what their disorder is. And we know that depression, it worsens all of the symptoms of psychosis. So again, I'm arguing we need to get a good explanation, one that our loved one can accept, can understand, can ask questions about, and hopefully feel more optimistic about. So normalizing explanations. This was something we started out that the people coming into the clinics with really long-term mental health disorders were very positive about these kind of explanations. So voice hearing is something that the human brain easily does. It is not just a symptom of a severe mental disorder. So bereavement will apparently cause 30% of people to hear the voice of the loved one who's died, feel their presence, feel a touch or smell a perfume or an aftershave. And, and this goes right across different cultures. So that's really one in three people will have an episode of hallucination as part of the grieving process. I wonder how many people have suffered a bereavement 
before their psychosis and never grieved. Well, when you investigate it, it's incredibly common. And this normalizing explanation says, maybe the voices you hear now are something to do with the fact that you had the shock of your wife's death and you never grieved. You've been stuck in denial. This makes that kind of therapy sensible and it's normalizing. So it's not that you've got schizophrenia for life. You're someone who's never grieved and who maybe needs to get help to do that emotional job. We've mentioned trauma switches off self-nurture, particularly childhood and adolescent trauma. And uh, we know that trauma is powerfully linked to adult voice hearing. So if there is a trauma on the, the timeline, which we're going to come to later, I would be very interested in working out what that trauma was and making the link. Might that trauma you had, the fact you get bullied so badly at school, might that be something to do with the fact that you've got this paranoia now? If we do that explanation sensitively, it can really strike home and make sense for the person. What about lack of sleep? Well, if I keep lecturing and talking here right through the weekend, <laughs> you're all saying, no, Doug, don't do that. <laughs> but if we did do it and we all stayed up, some of us would be hallucinating by Monday morning. The human brain cannot tolerate long periods of time with poor sleep. Now, what we know about schizophrenia psychosis is that sleeping patterns are extremely poor. So maybe this voice hearing that you have has something to do with the fact you only sleep for three hours each night. I wonder if that's something we could work on together. If you get people sleeping better, you usually get improvement in their symptoms. Some people explain their the voice is in a completely different way. They say, oh, yeah, this is a spirit guide or this, this is my relatives who have passed over speaking to me. And if you have that kind of explanation, you, you actually cope a lot better. It must be said that the voices that mediums hear and the voices that our loved ones hear are actually very similar. It's just that they are explained in a different way. So normalizing explanations for voices. But you can see in this picture here that, that there's a ghost at the funeral. And I'm not claiming that, that, that we know everything about spiritual matters and parapsychological phenomena. So I'm always keeping an open mind about what a person might be experiencing. Talking about mediums, here's one of the most famous ones, Doris Stokes, who writes a book called Voices in My Ear. And, and you can see she's quite happy about it. And, and she had a lot of disturbing and strange voices. Some of them were positive. And uh, she believed that the main voice she heard was a Tibetan monk. And uh, she'd heard the voice of her deceased father when she was just 13. So she had that experience of voice hearing as many of us do after a death. But she always thought that it was a spiritual experience. That is an explanation, which means you don't get stigmatized. She, she never had medication, she never had a diagnosis, and it was easier to live with. All of these very brilliant people have had quite long episodes of voice hearing. I've mentioned Anthony Hopkins before, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, heard a spiritual voice and it changed his life. 
um, Sigmund Freud, whenever he left Vienna and he was in another country, he would hear voices telling him that he should go back home. He'd really been away from home a bit too long. So Freud had had voices. Um, Joan of Arc heard religious voices. So, so the, these are all people who've had voice hearing, controlled them to different degrees, and they've been part of a very successful lifestyle. They had a different explanation for them. So how, of, how many people will have an episode of voice hearing? Very, very high. I mean, something like 40 to 50%. Um, sometimes it's only a very short period. Sometimes it's a bit longer. Whether or not a person ends up in psychiatric services depends often on the severity of it as well as their explanation and maybe the other symptoms that they have. Children and adolescents very, very commonly see things that aren't there and hear people speaking to them. It seems to be, in many ways, a normal phase of development. The, the only things that seem to tell a clinical voice hearing from non-clinical are that people like Doris Stokes, the medium report, more positive voices, they get the negative ones as well, but they're more positive ones, or that they focus more on the positive ones. Um, they do not conclude that the voices are powerful or dangerous, and they believe that they are capable of controlling them. Now, these are all aspects of therapy that we attempt to use for people with psychosis. Focus more on the positive voices, explain them in a less threatening way, and learn that they're not that powerful. They can't actually make you do anything or do anything to you. You've got control. What about paranoia? Well, it's also a very, very common experience. I don't know how many of you have walked into a room and people have stopped talking, and maybe just for a minute, they seem to look at you and you're thinking, were they talking about me? <laughs> well, they might have been, but um, very often these are just brief paranoid thoughts and they were probably talking about something else altogether. So these kind of paranoid thoughts are very common. Paranoid beliefs are incredibly common. COVID is a hoax. Wow, that's, that's an amazing belief. And I can't see where that comes from in terms of evidence, but it has gone predominantly around the world into different cultures. But we do know that just over 3% of people get a, a delusion every 18 months. So these are accumulating in society and some folk are getting better. Now, if you want to look at um, explanations of voice hearing, there's the Intervoice uh, website, and, and that's full of good explanations. People talking about what their voices say, how they come and go, how they got control of them. So a loved one, if they would go on that website, might find something very interesting. Paranoidthoughts.com, people are on there talking about how they had these thoughts and these delusions and how they got over them, how they changed over time. Very, very useful websites. The other useful website is treatingpsychosis.com, which is a whole load of downloadable information. So normalizing explanations for thought disorder and negative symptoms. When you're given your first speech in public, I bet it comes over thought disordered. And this is such a common experience because you want to do well and you're nervous and it just comes out as a big jumble. 
it can appear a bit dot disordered. What about when a politician gets asked a question and they answer a completely different question? It comes over as a thought disordered answer and you cannot understand what they say. Isn't it a wonderful day when someone asks a politician a question and they just give you a straight answer? Doesn't happen very often, does it? They give you a thought disordered answer. If you look at poetry and rap, that these often go beyond the normal links of language and can be really powerful because they do that. So thought disorder, there's a lot of it about. And uh, it kind of comes and goes in certain situations. But it certainly in some people with psychosis is something that needs an explanation. What oh, about negative symptoms? Well, people with negative symptoms we know have given up. They don't think they can do it, anything much. But after many illnesses, there's a period of slow recovery during which you take stock and try and build your strength. So maybe that's a good way to explain negative symptoms. And I've heard my colleague David Kingdon do that with great success. Certain times of your life, you, you do less. In your adolescence, very often, you're not hitting a lot of goals. Bears go into hibernation for the winter. So uh, it, it is possible to use these kind of explanations for thought disorder and for negative symptoms. An explanation is the cornerstone of building recovery. But first, we need to have a gentle optimism and we need to have that certain quality of relationship so that we can work on these, on these explanations. So the patients kept telling us these normalising explanations were crucially important and some of them really felt motivated and empowered by seeing these two new psychiatrists who were talking in a different way of course we got a lot of rotten eggs thrown at us for for giving these explanations which seemed anti-medical model but i'm not bothered as long as i can defend them the patients like them and they start to get better. And I think these are defensible explanations. So if we can have a normalizing explanation, then the loved one looks at their medicine and pulls out the leaflet and it says, this medication is for schizophrenia. And you're right back into the stigma again. So is there anything we can do with this diagnostic label, this horrible, archaic diagnostic label? Well, it's a very old diagnosis. The idea that the mind is split between thought and emotion. So, so this name is actually about emotional incongruity which is actually a very rare symptom of schizophrenia. And if you look at psychiatrists trying to make their mind up on this diagnosis, they very often won't agree with the case of difficult cases. And this is very often seen when there have been very serious uh, criminal events and the psychiatrists are trying to work out, is this schizophrenia? Is this personality disorder? Is this neither? And very often they can't decide. So some countries have given it up. And I think as far as I know, Japan is the only one. And they switched it to integrative disorder, which is nice. I would much rather have integrative disorder than delusional disorder or schizoaffective. And the follow-up survey showed that this had reduced stigma and had triggered increased recovery ra rates. What is in a name? A lot. A lot's in a name. 
Sir Robin Murray, the great British psychiatrist, recently said that the diagnostic label would be consigned to the garbage bin of medical history. Now, he studied schizophrenia all of his life. So that's a big statement for Sir Robin to make. And that's coming from the very top of psychiatry. Psychosis is a stigmatized word as well, but I would rather have psychosis than schizophrenia because you can put in a label beside it, anxiety psychosis, cannabis-induced psychosis, traumatic psychosis. And complex PTSD is kind of getting into the same bracket as a psychotic disorder caused by trauma, and it's just got a better name. I once had a patient say, tell me she was delighted by the switch of label to complex PTSD. So we're on now to the ABC model. So we've got the normalizing explanations. That works for lots of people. We've got doing something with the word schizophrenia, because it's just too scary to have. We need a different word. Our next one is, can we look at the ABC model? Now, I think, Molly, you're going to show this video, are you? So I'm going to stop sharing, and let's hope this works, if you can show the, the video. All right. Here we go. Okay, Tony, so we've been talking about your... <laughs> They're the same. We're back here again. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I don't see the point in this, really. Uh-huh. All right, okay. All right, I'll get that. But what they're saying now is that I'm a complete waster and I don't deserve any therapy. Right. Right. Gosh. How you, how you, how's that making you feel? I'll make my blood boil, I'll tell you. Who are they to tell me that I don't deserve any therapy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, you're getting pretty wound up as we're, as we're here together. Yeah, yeah, and you. Yeah. yeah. Tony, I'm going I'm to ask you to, to kind of pull your attention away from what you're hearing right now just for a minute okay, if that's okay, okay. Yeah. try try and and to and to think about what it was like just now as you were getting angry yeah and what what whether your voice has changed or not while, while that was going on um i'll try i'll try um first of all i come in sat down and they know what they said was oh here you are again and it was kind of, kind of jolly, a voice that was saying as if this is quite nice. Uh -huh. And then they come in with the negatives, you know. Right. You right. don't deserve it. Right. And I got really annoyed. And then they started swearing at me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They were saying stuff about me. I'm not going to repeat it, but they're swearing yeah. about me yeah. Yeah. in your presence. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you're an important person. Yeah. So I don't think they should be doing that. Right. We could have a conversation about me being important another time, but keep going with what, what you were saying about, about that. I was going to shout. I was going to really let them have it. And I thought, no, nope, uh -huh. no, nope, let's just try. And and then you pulled me back and said, try and pay attention. That was, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And funnily enough, they started to kind of back off a wee bit then. That's interesting. That's right. And what about right now while you've been talking with me? Uh, they backed off a bit again. Right. But I'm really scared. Mm -hmm that they're going to start again. Okay. So I'm kind of listening all the time, mm -hmm. waiting for them to start. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I, I, I've been wondering about then while you were talking just now is, is the relationship between how much kind of anger you're feeling and, and how much, uh, how intense and how loud the, these voices get, whether, whether these, it changes. Well, of course, I get angry when you're, they get loud. I uh -huh. get really angry. Yeah, right. Any man would. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when you pulled your attention back into our conversation, mm. what, 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 how did that affect the emotion that you were feeling? How did that affect your anger? And it settled down a bit. Okay. 
I had to need to really kind of focus on you. Yeah. Because they're yeah. really, you yeah. know how loud they are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I really noticed you working to do that. I was, but if I really try to uh-huh. focus on you uh-huh. and listen to your voice and the sound of it and the, yeah. the tone of your voice, right? then it seems to, they go away a bit and I calm down a bit. Okay, okay. So what um, what conclusions do you draw from that, Tony? Um, just that the voices are making me really angry. Uh-huh. And uh, if I really concentrate, uh-huh. I seem to be able to zone them out yeah. just a little bit. Yeah. If I've got another voice to listen to, uh-huh. it seems I can zone them out. Uh-huh. That's that's really, really interesting. So do you think then that being able to regulate your, your emotion might have an influence on how much voices you hear? I don't know. Well, let me t- just take you through that example. So when when you so you you heard the voice as you were coming in, they, it was mm. kind of pulling you in. It was the yeah, yeah, it was know, doing that. It was yeah. nice in some ways, but, it was, but, yeah. but 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 so it got your attention. Yeah, and then it hit you with something that made you feel really angry. Builds you up, knock you down. Okay, that's what they're like. So I'm getting I, angry just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, I could really understand that. Yeah, I really could. As you were getting more angry, I, I guess I'm wondering which way around it. Is it the voices making you angry or is the anger that you experience having an influence on, on your voices? That's what I'm wondering about, which way around that goes, or is it, is it both ways around? I think maybe it's both ways. Right. But the sounds of it could be both, couldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it could. Absolutely but right. I'm angry. I've always been angry. I don't do many other emotions, you know. Right. Well, maybe maybe it's just that there's not much room for other emotions mm, at, at maybe. the moment. But I'm wondering. I felt then, quite sad when you said that, but I don't yeah. really know why. Yeah, I think that's 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 really interesting mm. to hear. Um, and makes me feel sad to to mm. imagine that uh, that that's how you're feeling right now, and and to to imagine that most anger is mostly what you're experiencing. I can understand you feeling sad about that. I wonder, is, is there something that you could do to check out over the next week whether um, regulating your anger might help you bring your voices under more control? So how do you regulate your anger? Okay, I just don't have any idea how I might do that. Okay, that's really, really helpful for you to put that on the table. So I wonder, from the point of view of what we've talked about just now, or the experience that you've had in this session, whether there's anything that you could take from this about how to disengage yourself when when you're getting angry, taking your attention away from your anger, letting it settle down. I could... uh... Maybe watch a video. Okay. Uh-huh. I could watch something not too violent or anything, something quite relaxing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That, that, sounds, that sounds like a good idea. Um, and there was something really key that you said that you had to do to take your attention away. Mm. Listen to the tone uh-huh. and qualities uh-huh. of somebody else's voice. Right, yeah. I think that's what I've learned uh-huh. today about this. That's uh-huh. really quite interesting. Uh-huh. So, like, maybe I should watch a film with a speaking in it, okay, and listen to what the people are saying and try and explore what the, their voices are like. Uh-huh. That sounds like, and a good try idea. to not be so angry. That sounds like a really good idea to me. How does it feel as a as a plan? So, I, I watch a video once a day and try and do that. Okay. Can come back and tell you how it goes, and particularly uh, at the time when your when your voices are starting to wind you up, or to to yeah. So it's to I suppose comparing mm-hmm. what what it's like when you get angry and tune into your um, outrage 
at, at, at what the voices are doing to you. Yeah. Um, compared to, I guess, noticing that the pull to do that and get angry, but then taking your attention maybe into into a video and doing that really careful piece of uh, attentional focus on tone and content of somebody mm. else's voice. I've got a question for you. Okay. Which is the best video to do that with? Mm. I don't really know. I normally watch kind of like uh, like gangsters and stuff like that. Okay. But that's back to the same old, same old anger, isn't it? They'll certainly wind you up, won't they? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm guessing it's something that's got it's got to be interesting enough to mm. to ho hold your attention, mm. but maybe not one that uh, is exciting and, and winding you up in in that way. Mm. I wonder what that is. Mm. I guess it might be different. I guess it'll depend on on your interest. What, what mm. do you, What do you think? What, what kinds of things? What kinds of movies do you enjoy? Like, mm. I know you like the gangster ones. We've got yeah. got that. <laughs> But I think you might be right that that might not be the, the best choice. I think something that's a bit gangstery but a bit funny. Okay. How about Batman? That sounds like a Because really of that good... Joker's in there. He's yeah. got a really interesting voice. And uh -huh. the Batman's got an interesting voice, hasn't he? Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So maybe I'll, yeah. I'll get the Batman uh -huh. and I'll try that. Okay, that sounds like a really, really yeah. top choice. Okay. All right, Doug, back to you. Okay, so I, I think that was a lovely little video clip. Uh, um, Steve Moorhead, who plays the psychiatrist in that, is a Newcastle psychiatrist, and he, he talks in a, in a very helpful way. It was good for me to role play my patient, this was somebody I looked after for a long time. And when I actually role played him, I think for the first time I understood him. I understood where he was coming from. And, and so I would recommend that if you ever get the chance to role play your loved one, that I think you should do that. Uh, if it's a chance to get some feedback and, and really feel where they're coming from. And, and what I was able to do in that role play was to really realize the anger was his big emotion. His anger had dyed the color of his soul, as Marcus Aurelius might say. And he had never quite realized that anger was key in terms of his voice hearing. Steve guides him towards a realization that if the A is the voice hearing, the C is anger. And he'd never made that link before. So there's an emotional C there. There's also an emotional B there. Because what he said was, I'm always listening for them. I'm always waiting for them to start up. So he's hypervigilant. And he's just ready to become angry with them. So we've got two Cs, an emotional and behavioral one. And his B, his belief about the voices, was stated a few times. They shouldn't be saying things like this. It's just not right. It's downright unfair. You're an important person. They shouldn't be saying that. That this is the tyranny of the shoulds. So when we keep within our own minds telling ourselves, this, that and the other should not be happening. We don't actually have control over that, but we can control how we think think about those voices. So will watching the Batman with the Joker enable him to realize that he doesn't need to be so angry? He doesn't need to wait for the voices all the time. And he can start to have a different thinking style in relation to his experience. This is the ABC in action. And it's extremely powerful. And it's very interesting that at one point in the video, it just goes a bit deeper. And uh, in the role, I say to the therapist, I'm actually starting to feel a bit sad. And, and there we're going into a deeper 
level of emotion. So I think what Steve did was right for the role play. He acknowledged it and he said, I feel sad to know that you feel sad just now. So, and that's the way I would suggest that you deal with it because this young man with the voices had a history of physical abuse and all kinds of violence in his younger days. And that sadness had never been worked with. So a good therapist will maybe get to that sadness. But what you can do is have a shot at role play in your loved one, really feel what their emotions and their behaviours are around the psychotic symptoms. And then it might be possible to do what Steve did there and guide them into a new way of dealing with their symptoms. Now, we've been going for about an hour. I wonder if we should have a little break. What do you think, Bob? This would be a great moment for a break, Doug, if you want to take one. From Shui. And when we come back after, well, just have five minutes, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we come back after five minutes, we shall take some questions at this point. I don't know if Bob's got any questions, but well, if there are any, we, we will try and answer them. So five minute break. We're going to come back about 10 past. And send me any questions you've got, please. Okay. See you okay. at 10 past. Keep your stuff on and we'll see you at 10 past.
Is the audio on? Yes, your audio is on. Oh. Are we ready to start, Bob? Yes, we've got a couple of questions. Let's get started. Okay. First of all, there were a couple of comments about people who had experienced quite stigmatizing uh, experiences. Uh, in some cases saying you, you have to stay away from your family and be completely independent at age 22. So, wow. Yeah. Why? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, That's amazing. I know. It's very disturbing. That's um, the worst possible advice. Yes. <laughs> well, um, was that recovery begins at home. Yes. Not in a state of total social isolation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some other kind of interesting questions about the the ABC role play, basically saying, what if our loved one isn't really open to talking about their experiences? And is this a standard part of cognitive behavioral therapy? And then finally, three-part question, how do you encourage someone to get into therapy? Well, these are a great sequence of questions, aren't they? Um, so the first question is, what if your loved one isn't open? And very often people aren't open. And uh, what I would like to know is what is the C? You, you know, what is the emotional C about this? Are they not being open because they're frightened? Are they angry? Are they sad? So I'd quite like to work out what the C is. And then maybe I could try and make links with that. And um, I would maybe talk, if say the loved one was sad, I might talk about things that made me sad. I would say, oh, I saw that television program today. It made me feel a bit down in the dumps. What did you think about it? So I would decenter it away from them and their experience and talk about the emotion and then maybe try to make the link back into the voices because the intervoice website gives lots of examples linking voices to certain emotional states or, or maybe a good ted talk about voices either maybe or maybe using some of these famous voice hearers like a uh, i think there's brian wilson of the beach boys there John Frusciante of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, famous voice hearers might allow a person to realise, hey, that guy was a brilliant guitarist. He's a voice hearer. Maybe it's not so bad. So I, I, I'd be using, but sometimes it's difficult. It just takes time sometimes. Sometimes you've got to wait and just keep trying different things and, and someday it'll, it'll get through. And the next bit of the question was what again, Bob? So the, yeah, the other the other bit of the question was um, if if the family member doesn't feel skilled enough to use a, a, a role play, which it's quite it's quite complex, how can they encourage their loved one to get into a cognitive behavioral type of therapy? What's the best way to encourage someone? Well, the ABC is an approach that's very very basic now. It's known about throughout mental health. I mean, it is a part of therapy, but therapy often is going beyond ABC. And, and we mentioned the sadness that came through in the role play. So it's going beyond to, to deeper issues. So almost anybody that works in mental health should have a knowledge of the ABC. And there's lots of people that, that mostly came from rational emotive behavior therapy. Um, and there's lots of courses where you can go and learn a bit about RET. Uh, and rational emotive behavior therapy is about that. It's about putting the B in. It's about changing the belief about the experience. And that's what Marcus Aurelius did about his death phobia. He changed the belief by changing the thinking. 
So most mental health professionals should hopefully know how to do it. There are courses on how you can learn how to do it. I would say it's a fairly basic technique that can give really big yield. I do think that it maybe does need a bit of practice. And if your mental health professional isn't prepared to help you with it, um, there's things like um, the Psychosis Reach program. I don't know if NAMI is going to provide any ongoing training around things like this, but it would be incredibly useful to do that because I think this is a fundamental technique which family members can do, which is pre-therapy and might allow somebody to break the shackles of psychosis and then move into therapy. What was the last bit of the question? I'll just add, uh, we'd like to get feedback in the survey. At the end, uh, there'll, there'll be a link to the survey. That would be a good place to tell us, would you like a more extended workshop or training on the, just on the ABC model, where we could really spend a lot of time? Let's see if people want that. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think that could potentially be a winner. Yeah. Uh, the next questions are, are uh, about um, how do you encourage someone to even consider therapy? I think that this sequence we've spoken about here, so we have a change in the family oh. member. So hopefully we might become a bit more optimistic and the loved one will be thinking, why are they getting a bit more optimistic? What's going on here? So they might see a change in us that we're a bit more hopeful. We've then got some techniques around loss of insight that, that we might be able to use. And then we actually try to help them get back into life a bit by using the normalizing, um, maybe by doing something with the very negative label of schizophrenia or schizoaffect. And then with an ABC, we might be able to demonstrate that we can change the experience and get a bit of control back. Just like the chap in the role play, he had had a kind of eureka moment. He'd listened to Steve's kind of slightly Irish accent and he thought, this distracts me from the voice. They've backed off. And then he says, I'm going to listen to the Batman and the Joker. He, he, he was a way to try something. Now, the next step for that guy, if he has a bit of success, is he, maybe he says, I want to see Steve more often, or I want to see another therapist. Maybe there's something in this. So I think we need to engender hope by this sequence that we're putting forward today. Yes, just a, a comment. I think that sometimes focusing on goals rather than symptoms can be really motivating to get into therapy with, with the idea, what are the important things you want to do in your life? And maybe you can get some help in therapy to, to, to do those things. Yeah, if you can get out of the stuckness to see that there is a potential to get back to do a hobby, to go fishing, to go for a nice walk, to go to a recovery college and learn something new, if you can see that potential, then I totally agree that that is great to, if you can get the goal, then you realize it's maybe worth getting there. Then the hope in the family member has transferred into a bit of optimism in the loved one who is suffering. So I, I think if that process can happen, goals are, are very useful. And no matter what your symptoms are, if you've got a bit of control, you can tackle your goals. Okay, well, we move on now and see some more examples of making sense of symptoms. So there's the ABC model. The A is the activating event. The B is what you're telling yourself. And the C is the consequences, which will be an emotion and a behavior. And in this role play, it's anger and it is hypervigilance, waiting for the voices all the time. Now, the key thing about the ABC is that people don't know they're doing it. They don't know how these things link up. 
that this chap had never really accepted that his anger was anything to do with the voices. But in this brief session, he seemed to start to realise that there might be a link. So uh, the, in terms of a delusion, the delusion is the B, the delusion is the belief, but there will still be the consequences afterwards. So in voices, the voices are the A. When you're talking about a delusion, the delusion is the B. And here's two examples of different types of self-talk about your experience. Someone hearing a loud, critical voice thinks, other people can hear this. Now, that's just not true. How dare he say that about me? And the emotional reaction is anxiety, shame and anger. He decides to buy himself a weapon in case he has to defend himself and he refuses to leave his house. Now, the emotional and behavioural C are just going to make this worse. How we deal with our symptoms determines their outcome. But here's another type of B. Someone hearing a loud critical voice says to himself, I know what this is. This is just the psychosis playing up. I must have been too stressed. I'm going to phone my mother, try and have a chat about it. If I'm allowed an extra tablet, I'll take an extra tablet and I'm going to get myself a good night's sleep. Now, with that second type of B, which family members hopefully can encourage, the, the emotional consequences are of calmness and of getting asleep and maybe seeing a family member, which are much more positive. And the voices themselves will often back off, as was shown in the role play. Changing the B changes the C and the A. So th this is a very useful way to go. We do need to try and catch the thought. So what Steve could have said to me in the role play there, see when you were getting angry, what was the thought that was passing through your mind? So we're trying to catch thoughts. It's not a question of what were you thinking? Because when you ask that, somebody will come up with an answer that they've thought up. We want to catch those automatic thoughts. And very often when a voice is speaking, there is an image there in the mind. So did you have a picture of what that person who is speaking might look like? And I've, I often get them to draw the image of the voice. And when they draw the image, it's normally something pretty horrendous. And we can help them come round to drawing a, a gentler image. I don't know if you've heard about avatar therapy. Avatar therapy is about exactly this. It's a treatment for voice hearing where you produce an image of the voice you interact with the image on the avatar machine and then you gradually change the image and make it more benign and speak to it differently. Then you practice it in real life and you do better with it. So avatar therapy is a useful approach. And very often people will be interested in playing with the avatar machine, even if they won't see a therapist. ABC for delusions. Here's an example. Um, there's a silver car. They're following me. Let's get out of here. Let's worry a lot about it. Let's take lots of safety and defensive maneuvers. So the delusion here is of being followed and being under threat. But here's a different B here on seeing the silver car. Oh, I once saw a silver car at that time my friend was assaulted. I'm going to check this out, though. There's only one driver driving slowly, looks quite friendly. Maybe I'm not under threat here so much. So changing the thoughts around the delusion 
can also be helpful, but it means you've got to, to test it out a wee bit. So this is a slightly more complex thing than the ABC. And this is very much a part of the therapy of the psychotic disorders. So if there's a trigger of some kind, and there usually is, the voice hearing starts up. And Tony Morrison argued for that voice to keep running, you really need to have a catastrophic explanation. So you need to be saying to yourself, wow, this is powerful. This is a witch. This is a demon. This is the devil. That This is something. This is the CIA. That this is something really dangerous. And Tony argued that if you don't have that kind of explanation, the voices should start to settle down. So with the catastrophic explanation, you get really hyped up. The patient in the video get angry, but it could be powerful anxiety. And we know that these emotions make the voices worse. So the catastrophic explanation is causing emotions which worsen voices. And that's what was happening in the role play. But on the other side of the diagram, we have avoidance. We mentioned social avoidance. The more you stay away from other people, the worse your symptoms will be. And other safety behaviours, like saying a lot of prayers or maybe hiding in a certain corner of the house or doing rituals or maybe using cannabis something to try and keep yourself safe from the, the experience. But of course, those safety behaviours make the whole thing worse. So we have a vicious cycle of positive feedback. And for every voice hearer, I have this diagram in their medical notes. I, I think it's crucial. And I'm sharing the diagram with the person who is suffering from this experience, and I'm sharing it with the nurses and the other staff members, so that we're all working on the same understanding of the experience. And of course, this then gives you a possible way into the situation. And when we find a way in, we might find that this vicious cycle of feedback starts to wind down and switch off so that the voices drop to being at a much lower level. So this is called the maintenance model or the circle of maintenance. And if you can draw one for your loved one, it's, it's a great thing to more understanding, but I think we might need that extra training that Bob was mentioning to actually think about how this might work because you're starting to come right to the frontiers of what a therapist would do because a therapist would actually decide which is the best way in here. They would negotiate with your loved one on which to tackle first. What's the first goal? So here's an example patient of mine, a young man, uh, very stressed, getting bullied at school, started using cannabis, didn't pay the drug dealers. They were coming around to his house with a lot of stress in that situation. He wasn't sleeping well, started to hallucinate. Here's his catastrophic explanation. I, I think he'd been watching a lot of Discovery Channel and uh, other things in the television. This must be these aliens and they're going to abduct me, and they're going to operate on me in their spaceship. So he had a real catastrophic idea about grey aliens were going to be after him, and that's what he was hearing. Um, because of this, he was terrified, and he just stayed up all night in case they turned up. Now, we know that lack of sleep causes voices, and we know that extreme anxiety causes voices. So there we've got the positive feedback there. So what does he do to keep himself safe? These are the safety behaviours on the other side. 
So what he decides to do is to put silver paper on his windows. Now, I'm not entirely sure where he got that one from. It, what he said was that it was to stop them attempting to abduct him. He seemed to think this would deflect any rays that come down. What it certainly did do was to attract a lot of attention in the neighbourhood. And a lot of people were standing outside his house talking about the silver paper. So it was hearing voices because the silver paper was on the window. The other thing he was doing was on the UFO website. And the people phone into this or, or go online and say, I've just seen a UFO over San Francisco and, and that goes in the system. Or I've seen one over Oslo and that goes in the system. So you can track where UFOs are being reported. And of course, this made him hyper vigilant and had his mind thinking about aliens all the time. This is the typical maintenance cycle. But I think if you look at that, you can start to see how potentially we might intervene with it. So what Bob is going to role play this young man, and that's his story about the, the grey aliens, and he's thinking about they're probably going to implant them with some alien genetic material. And I'm going to try and help Bob make some sense of it. So I'm, I've come over to see Bob in his house. Hi, Doctor, Bob. How's it, how's it going? Well, Dr. Trekton, did you close the door quickly when you came in? Oh, I'll, I will do. Yeah, I'll, absolutely. Okay, good. I'll, I'll just check it and make sure it's closed. Yeah, okay. What is, it, what is it you're worrying about, Bob? Oh, well, you see the windows. Yeah. Yeah, I've got them treated so that none of the rays can come through. Yeah, well, I've, I noticed all that stuff when I drove round to your house. Yeah. Have, have the neighbours said anything about it? Uh, I do hear people talking outside. Yeah. I, I wonder if, I, I don't, I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that that, that sort of prevents the, I get this buzzing. You know, mm. I've smoked quite a bit of cannabis. I get the buzzing and I think the the, the aluminum foil kind of blocks that out. So are, are you just staying in the house all the time, Bob? Yeah, I, it's much, I, I feel safe in here. And, uh, you know, I've been on this UFO site and uh, they just had a sighting, right? Just, you know, just an hour ago. And, and I got this buzzing in my head. And, and I, I looked on the site. Well, where was it they saw, somebody saw a UFO? Whereabouts was this it? This was just, you know, in my, my house, right, right, kind of north of San Francisco. And 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 I realized, wow, that was just the time I felt the buzzing. Oh, it's interesting, isn't it? And have you felt that buzzing experience at other times? I've, I've felt it other times too, yeah, yeah. And does it tend to fit with UFOs, being on the website when well, you feel looking you know i keep looking it up and uh sometimes it, it definitely it's it's absolutely that's what's happening no question yeah so sometimes it ties in with the yeah. ufos sometimes it doesn't oh maybe people have just missed them you know they're coming mm -hmm. over but people are are you know someone hasn't seen them i, I can see that you're very very is it anxiety that is coming across today? Oh, I can't. I can't really get to sleep at all, even with a lot of cannabis, because I just feel like I need to uh, just keep paying attention and making sure you know nothing's going on. With, well, with yeah. So I mean, if you awake a lot of the night, you must feel horrible when you try to get through the day. I mean, are, are you exhausted? I'm, I'm exhausted. I, I, I smoke pot just to calm down a bit. And, and uh, you know, and then I get some of that buzzing going on. So it, it just. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible experience you're awful. going through just now. Yeah. And, and I just ask, what are these voices saying to you? It's hard to make out if I really try to pay a lot of attention. I, I, it's something about they're going to be 
there's, there's an experiment going on. Uh-huh. I'm going to be part of the experiment. It's hard to make out exactly what they're saying. So it's kind of a muff- funny language. It, oh, is it like an alien language then? So it's a little bit of an alien language, yeah. A little bit like a mechanical sound. And how long has this been going on for now? Oh, boy. You know, it's probably the last three months. I mean, it's gotten a lot worse lately. Uh, I, I keep, I'm i having trouble sleeping. I'm, I'm just wondering what kind of aliens would come and torture somebody like this? Because the abductions... I've heard people talk about, they just seem to be a one-off sort of thing, don't they? Yeah. You've been tortured for months here. Well, I've always worried, you know, about the next thing that's going to happen. Yeah. But that's so why I'm, sleep. I'm just kind of listening to make sure there's no other signal coming through. I wonder if the first thing that we might try to do would be to get a night's sleep. That would be I mean, wouldn't be that be fantastic? Because you're out on your feet, you're exhausted, yeah. you're wired, you're anxious. I, I'm too scared to get to sleep. Who's going to check? Who's going to check on what's happening? Well, is there anybody that could come over and stay overnight? Have you got a family member or a friend who could try and stay awake while you might get asleep? I, I wonder if my brother would be willing to do that. Is he nearby? Yeah, he is. He, you know, he, he he's pretty worried about the situation. Maybe he'd be willing to help. Well, that sounds good. So I wonder if I could uh, speak to your brother. Is that the brother that's got the dog? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, how would you feel about having your brother and the dog over? Uh, you know, I like his dog, uh, and, and his dog is very, you know, really uh, kind of a good guard dog as well. He, he, oh, he, oh, dogs are, they're, they're alert, aren't they? They don't yeah. sleep much. I mean, if there was any threat going on, if they heard anything, they'd start to bark, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. I'd kind of, I'd, I'd feel a lot safer with... with. Uh... So could we just try and get you one night's sleep by getting your brother and the dog over? That could make and a difference, yeah. yeah. See if yeah. that makes any impact on this whole experience. Well, if I, if I was able to get some sleep, I wouldn't have to smoke so much cannabis to calm down. It, it, you know, it might help. Well, that, that's very interesting. So do you want me to speak to your brother or, or do you want to speak to him yourself? Oh, I, I, let me give him a call. I'll, I'll give him a call. It's, it's a good idea. OK, well, will you give him my number so yeah. that if he has questions, he can ask me any questions about it. Yeah, he's a bit he's a bit confused about what's happening. I hope you can explain it to him. So if you're agreeable, I'll share with them how these things all connect up together. Yes, that, that'd be great. We got a plan, Bob? We do have a plan. Yeah, I, I feel a little bit of relief here. Maybe I can get a good night's sleep and you know things look better after a good night's sleep. Yeah, so we will reconvene again after you've had a good night's sleep. Yes. And we'll check out what's happened to the whole experience. Well, thanks for the visit. As you go out, just be quite quick about opening the yep. door. Okay. I, I will do. I absolutely will do. Great. Thank you, Dr. Drake. Okay. okay. Hey, Bob, I'll see you soon. So that's kind of what a mental health professional could be doing, isn't it? It's very, very brief. It didn't take long. And it connected up all the bits of the experience. Now, very often you'll speak to somebody and they won't buy it. They just won't buy it. But usually there's one bit of the cycle of maintenance that they will buy. So, for example, if Bob had rejected everything else, I might say, okay, for the next hour, can we go on this UFO website together and we'll find out where these UFOs come up and we'll see what happens to the ringing experience in your ear. Just a one-off experiment to see if there is a link there or if there isn't. Now, if there is a link there, you're going to have to explain that. That's the risks we take. (laughs) We never know how an experiment's going to end up. But we'll get information. And if me and Bob are working together on it, maybe that's the key thing. 
And maybe we can see a way beyond those early attempts to make sense and change the dynamic, change the coping. So it's not a little role play. Here's an example of somebody that I saw who nearly ended up in a mental health ward under the Mental Health Act in the UK. And, and he was a, a Roman Catholic priest and he was covering a number of parishes, you know, was covering a number of other people's work. And he got really stressed out by it all. And he started getting thoughts pop into his head. Now, these were intrusive thoughts. And he had thoughts about violence. Maybe he was going to be violent to somebody. And he had thoughts about sex. Now, as a spiritual man, he found these almost unbearable. And what he decided was, and this is his catastrophic explanation, I must have been possessed by the devil. That's what he decides. And of course, this makes him incredibly anxious, like Bobby staying awake at night time. He tells his bishop that he thinks he's been possessed by the devil. He tells his GP he spends a lot of time fasting and praying. Now, the doctor that he tells, he says to the doctor, I think I've been possessed by the devil, and I think I'm maybe going to be violent. And the doctor says, wow, I'm really thinking this is probably a schizophrenia, and uh, I'm going to phone into the hospital and uh, get you admitted. And, and, of course, this priest had given up by that time and went along with it. Anyway, it was me he saw in the hospital, <laughs> and uh, I said to him, let's try and make sense of this. Let's draw the diagram. And you've been doing loads of work and you're having these thoughts popping into your head. I mean, do you know that everybody gets thoughts like that? Everybody gets the odd, unpleasant thought pop into their mind. It's just something the brain does. It doesn't mean you're going to act on them. Everybody has intrusive thoughts and they don't act on them. Maybe what we should be doing is reducing your pressure of work, giving you some time off and giving you some relaxation. So he says to me, it's not the devil then. And I said, well, I have no contact with anyone who's ever been possessed by the devil that I know of. I wonder if you've had any contact with somebody like that. And he said, no, I haven't. I really haven't. To be honest, maybe it's not the devil. He's a, a massively supernatural, powerful being. I don't suppose he would just do this. So he came in to see me. He, we had a discussion about intrusive thoughts. Uh, we gave him a lot of support. He had time off. He went back to work. This cycle disappeared. I think if he'd seen a different psychiatrist, he might still be in hospital. And he might be up to here with different types of medication. It didn't need to happen. It didn't happen. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> uh, let's uh, see what's up next. Um, I just wonder, is there any questions come through at this point, Bob, before we go on to the timeline idea? There's a couple of questions. One, I think a good one is a question, can these methods really work with someone who's had long-term psychotic illness? Or is this just for people who are just getting ill? These things really work for people with long-term psychotic illness because nobody has ever tried them. Usually, they've simply never been done. And, and this is the wonderful thing that me and David Kingdon did, working with people that were chronically ill. It was the first time they were ever done. And, and people were like, their eyes were like, wow, this is different, you know? And they were making progress. Our first study was in people with chronic, severe schizophrenia. And the improvements seen were highly impressive. So we're getting things like an average of 40% symptom improvement across the group. And that was the first study in the year 2000, which Bob has probably got a memory of or read, that really launched this whole approach. 
But there is a window in early psychosis where we are really doing very badly if we're not doing these things. We mentioned there's a two-year window at the start of a psychosis where if you can get into doing this stuff, you can really make strong gains. But I'm definitely working with people with chronic psychotic disorders. Great question. Will we press on to the timeline? So I think families can really help a mental health professional by doing a timeline. Because very often we'll say to the, to the client, tell me more about how this all started, which is a great question. Because it means we move before the psychosis. And very often people can talk about that time frame and move out of this, the delusion for a bit to talk about how it all started. And family members will often know a lot of the history that the mental health professional won't know. So we can get a quite a detailed timeline and it's really important not just to put the negatives on it. So that we've got all the negatives below the line, might be failing exams, getting involved in fights at school, trouble with the police, all those negatives below. Let's have the positives above the line. Had a number of good friends at that time in life. Had a success experience, an apprenticeship or a bit of work. Had a good early relationship with a partner. So we're trying to balance up the timeline. And what the therapist will do when they have a timeline is try to work with these negative episodes and positive episodes to develop them and take the legs away from the psychotic symptoms. That this is about working on things in their previous life. So you better believe the voices are talking about something. They're talking about events that have happened in a distorted way. And we've got to believe that delusion. It's about something in their life. That's the seed of truth at the heart of the delusion. So the timeline is, I've seen people recover doing timelines, usually with therapists, but I've had families backing up. It's been really helpful. I've done my own timeline and I would say we should all of us do our timeline, but maybe this is going to be something that Bob might organize some training for at some point in the future. Because you see your own timeline, you realize that you've actually done all right. Because we all of us tend to magnify the negatives. So timelines are another way to make sense. And particularly for when there's lots of voices or there's big delusions, this is a good way to go. So here's another quick role play. And Bob's going to be the therapist here. He's going to try and access some timeline material. And I'll, I'll play one of my clients that I'll call John, who he believes he is a general and star of, in charge of all NATO troops. So he's right at the top of the tree. Joe Biden, I think, was probably getting fed up with the number of letters that he was getting sent and Boris Johnson was getting hundreds as well, but he wasn't paying his rent, which got mental health services involved. Hi, Bob. What are you doing here? Oh, Jai, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I wanted to see you. Um, I wanted to see how you're doing here. And I understand maybe you're, you're having some trouble with paying your rent and, and your lease. And yeah, I was hoping is, that could be helpful. What, what have you been up to? That guy, he's got a five-star general in his flat and he's charging me rent. What is uh, wrong with him? Maybe you, we could start with what have you been up to? What have you been doing? Oh, well, I've been sending my, my commands out. I send them out through, there, there's a guy that comes around to see me, a kind of care worker. Yes, so yeah. I give him my commands and he takes them off and, must send them off to the troops and uh, the government, etc. But I make sure I keep Joe Biden and that Boris Johnson. I keep them. I keep them doing what they should be doing. Is it too much to ask that they do the right thing? Uh, 
and when did you start sending out all of these letters? When that when did that start up? Well, I, I started doing this. It was just shortly after I went through that bad patch. What was the bad patch? It, it was that patch. I, I was working in the prison actually. I, I was working as a prison officer, and the, the prisoners really liked me. I've got to be honest. Yeah. And I got on well with the staff, and the staff liked me. I was good at my job. And do you know what they did? No, I don't know. I'd like to hear more. The sergeant on the shift, a good man, a really good man, they said he was bringing drugs in. Oh. It was an absolute lie. I told them all. I said, it's not him. You've got the wrong man. Yeah. And, and what the, happened? Yeah. It's the guy with a sniffer dog. The sniffer dog. He never sniffed out a single drug in his life. The dog was bringing the drugs in. Uh, and, and how did this come out for you, John? What happened? I caught him. I, I caught the guy. He, he denied it. He denied it. Uh, I went to the governor of the prison. And I said, you need, you're putting an innocent man out of work. What about his family? What about him? I the to to said, and the governor said, oh, oh yeah. Well, we just don't believe a word you're saying. Uh, a sniffer dog can't bring drugs in. And at that point, I, I get really, really anxious. And I, I realised at that point that they were starting to follow me. They were following me, Bob. So let's just go over this a bit. No one was listening to you. You you, 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 it's, you tried to make a case, it sounds like, at, at high no, levels. Absolutely. And no absolutely. one paid attention. No. Ah, uh, and what were you feeling? Oh, I was furious. I had the evidence and they ignored it. They Total ignored frustrated. me. And a terrible wrong was done. Yeah. Now, you see, just after that, uh, I managed to escape. And I went across the border. And I was hanging out down there for a while. And there were some children there. And they asked me, if I was Jesus. Oh. What do you make of that? I don't know. I'm very interested. I, I don't know what to make of that. What, what did you make of it? Well, I, I, I thought, you know, these children, they know I'm special. Uh, they, they know. They can see it. Uh, I was just, I was living rough on the streets. Uh, it was at this point I started to realize now I, I'm not Jesus. Yeah. I'm actually in charge. I'm so, actually in charge of the whole thing. Yeah. So let's just recap for a moment. You, it sounds like you had a really stressful low period uh, in the in the prison. No one was listening. You felt uh, kind of completely frustrated and and uh, powerless, I suppose. Yeah. 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 And then, and the way that turned out, that must have been so disappointing. Well, it never gets sorted out. But uh, I'm, I have always stood up for the little man. Yeah. I've always stood against injustice all yeah. my life. Yeah, yeah. And then it sounds like later on, you began to get a feeling when, when you, when these kids asked you this question, you got a feeling of, uh, they, they, they see me as someone really important. Yeah, yeah. They, they they knew there was something going on. That was the moment I knew. Aha. Uh -huh. Is that when that, the, 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 the I realized it. Yeah. Did the letter writing start shortly after that? Yeah, I moved back across the border because yeah. I'd understood what was going on. Yeah. Started writing the letters into this flat. I paid them rent for a while. I don't know why it still wants rent. Hmm. We'll, we'll come back to that. That's where we are. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, that really helps me put this a bit in context after this really difficult low period. And, and did, you, did you lose your job as a result of this situation in the prison? Yeah, when I went across the border, uh, they said terrible things about me. Uh, so there was a very rough period, a low period, um, where you felt totally dismissed in terms of trying to be helpful. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah. I think for the sake of time, we probably, yes, we probably should timeline at this. But I think you can see 
there is a lot before this big delusion starts. And underneath it all, there's stuff in his past that he's never really spoken about. And the big delusion arises in relation to particular life events. And big delusions like this, I'm usually asking questions about how did it all start and what was happening in your life. And Bob is able to pinpoint a low period. He never saw it as that, I don't think. But he's going to start now to maybe look at his life on a timeline in a different way. And maybe this delusion will start to fade because we've seen that happen so many times. This guy still thinks he's a five-star general, but he pays his rent. <laughs> and he goes shopping. He goes to the supermarket. He goes to the drop-in. So the delusion's still there, but he's not acting on it anymore. And he has he's in a state of recovery. He has quality of life. Hey, we're getting near to the end of this say, show, which is good. Is it nearly time up? Families are in a great position to use normalizing explanations. That was the first thing. Normalizing materials on the websites and things you can download and print out. TED Talks, very useful normalizing. Um, despite doing all of this, we never want to change the medicine. That is something in the realm of the psychiatrist to sort out. We want to work closely with the psychiatrist to balance up the, the, the circles of threat, drive, and nurture. That model might be one that works. I think we've seen today that the ABC can be dramatic. And most people with chronic illness have never had that approach. The circles of maintenance are fascinating and certainly they're in therapy. But if families could attempt to draw them up and who knows, they might see a way where they might be able to, to help their loved one. But in particular, if you're trying to do that, you probably want to be working with a therapist. And Bob has shown us that can be done online, which is really important. Families are great in timelines. They're not used often enough. A good therapist will use the family to help produce the timeline. And I know that that's something that Bob has done with one of his clients who recovered. So I think just a few questions now. Yes. So uh, some questions more may be coming in, but one sort of perennial question is, where is the training for therapists and providers on this model? And then maybe secondly, you know, where's the training for families, uh, um, you know, who, you know, just to really get more of an understanding of, of kind of how to help. Of course, we're, we're doing that second part here. Uh, so where is the training for therapists? Yeah. So there is a tremendous worldwide movement around this type of therapy. It is developing all the time. The research is developing. But I must say it is kind of a state lottery or a, a city lottery as to whether you have therapists doing this locally. Um, the system in the US doesn't necessarily allow you to access these kind of therapists. So Bob will know much better than me about that, but we're certainly training a lot of therapists and, and there is a, a political publication uh, about training more and more therapists across all states. Again, Bob will know more about that. So it's becoming increasingly available. We need to train more nurses in this. That's something that really needs to happen. Mental health nurses need to learn more about it. And the first skills project, which is based in Harvard and run by Kate Hardy, is a nurse training project. So, so that, that's a useful thing. Families, this is a taster for it. There's the Psychosis Reach project running out of Seattle, which I think you can sign up for. But maybe NAMI Marine, if people want it, could organize something 
in a bit more depth, more role plays, more examples. If that's something that people want, then Deborah, Lou and Bob will certainly be able to think about whether that could be put on. Are there any other questions? Or Bob, do you want to say anything about that last question? Oh, well, really important. I, I, I think right now there, uh, there are not enough providers who are well-trained. Um, we've done some in the past. We've done some training for county providers. Um, and I guess we'd love to hear in the feedback, is that something that, that uh, particularly our, our members feel is important for us to pursue, uh, supporting more training of providers? Yeah. Um, There's a lot of stuff in this Back to Life Volume 2 about making sense of psychosis. So if you want to, to read, that's got stuff in it that is written for families. But I, I think we, we, could, we could do more at NAMI Marine if people wanted that. And we're getting a lot of things in the chat suggesting that there's a lot of interest. Yes. So that's us bang on time, Bob. I think it is. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if there's any last questions, but it's been a, a real delight for me and for Bob and the and the team to be here to be able to talk to you all and to, to show this range of making sense approaches and let you see the video and the, and the role plays. So a. Uh, if there's no last comments, Deborah, do you want to say anything to just close this? Or? Maybe we can go to the, 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 to the last slide with a link to our survey. I'll, I'll just do a quick closing comment. Yeah, so yep. I wanted to, Dr. Trekking, thank you so much for working with us. This is our third year of workshops and webinars. We look forward to many more and uh, fantastic experience to have, to have you for two hours. If you've enjoyed this, consider a donation to NAMI Marin to support more of Dr. Turkington's work and our work. Um, and then finally, we've got a survey. It'll take just a minute or two to fill out. It's a direct link in, your, in the materials we sent you. The link is right here and it's also in the chat. If you could do the survey right now, you're probably more likely to, to, to do it if you click on it right at the end of our meeting. And we would so appreciate your feedback. I think that's the wrap up. Again, Dr. Trenton, thank you so much for spending time with us and, and, and putting so much work into these presentations. We look forward to three more presentations this year. Thank you, Bob, and thank goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next you time. Okay. okay. Hope Bye -bye. things go well for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>